Hello, this is Anne de Geest, and I'm doing an update on January 16 on the Omicron tidal wave. So much has happened in the last uh, two weeks or three weeks now since the last update that I wanted to do a special. So let's kind of go, go through it. Uh, a quick disclosure there, this is a public service. I'm not getting a, a dime, literally, uh, for this work. I hope you appreciate it, so please give me a thumbs up. Uh, oh, this is a science-based video uh, using the latest scientific research on Omicron. Uh, sources include CDC, FDA, John Hopkins, and all of that. Um, this is to help you make an informed decision for yourself and your family. I'm not making any medical recommendation. So what has happened uh, since we talked three weeks ago? Good and the bad and the ugly, and we're going to review all of this. The good is that uh, there's at-home tests uh, coming at you uh, from the government. We'll talk about that. We're going to do full review of all the home tests. Some are better than others. Uh, Omicron is less severe. Uh, for most people who have a breakthrough cases, it provides them like a sore throat and cold symptoms. But unvaccinated is still at high risk of being hospitalized. Uh, data come out that it shows a 50% lower hospitalization due to a lower attack on the lungs that the Delta variant had. We're going to do a review of the mask effectiveness. You absolutely need to upgrade to N95. And new data just came out that showing that Moderna is more protective against hospitalization than Pfizer. On the bad side, uh, this is really important. Uh, antigen testing gives you a false negative in the first three days after you've been infected. And unfortunately, that's the time where you're the most infectious there. So you cannot rely on just the antigen testing to know if you've been infected. Uh, you really need to take precaution. Uh, there's a lot of mixed European data on Omicron, if it's peaking or not. Uh, a new data show that Omicron is able to evade 70% of the antibodies, and that's why you need a booster shot, because that's the only way you can get enough antibodies to fight Omicron. Uh, there's limited drug treatment availability against Omicron, so you should still try to avoid you know, getting it, uh, because there's not too much we can do to really cure Omicron. And there's a lot of breakthrough cases, including people who have boosted. Um, but good news, only 1% of boosted patients uh, that have a breakthrough are hospitalized. The majority, the vast majority are unvaccinated. On the ugly side, since we talk, Omicron has tripled in the last 21 days. And we're going to see that it's not just the case. It's just not driving hospitalization and unfortunately mortality, and majority being unvaccinated patients. Uh, you absolutely need to be boosted to get any type of serious protection against Omicron. Unfortunately, 62% of Americans are still at risk. And the ICU and mortality now are surging. They typically have that three weeks delay. So we're going to take a deep dive on that. So Omicron is this red uh, called 21K. And as you can see, it's taking over the world. It's already over 47% of the cases worldwide. Uh, and you can see as a result of this, Omicron has absolutely exploded. It's now multiple times uh, the daily peak that we saw in the last surge a year ago. So what are we looking at? Uh, Omicron is now three to four times the prior peaks. And he seems a worry there. You can see the cases in the United States. This is all normalized data. It's around 2,362 cases per million. But if we follow what has happened to France and Australia, we could still double our case rate. Or maybe we'll be lucky and maybe we'll follow what happened to the UK. Uh, we'll talk more about that. But uh, my warning is that if, if we learn from Europe and we spend more time on that, we may still have a right to go before we, we hit the peak. Difference between Delta and Omicron, I'm sure you have heard a lot about it. If, if you haven't seen my video of three weeks ago, take a look. I did a deep dive on that. But at the high level, Omicron is three times more transmissible than the previous uh, coronavirus. Uh, it, it's creating less severe diseases. Uh, but because there's such a tidal wave, we're going to see the hospitals are being uh, inundated by patients there. And uh, you can be reinfected, and even if you have uh, a booster, uh, some people can get infected, but you have, you have a high protection uh, against hospitalization if you get boosted there. So, so here's the data coming out. A very, very big study from Kaiser on 52,000 Omicron patients just came out. 
and it shows a 50% lower hospitalization, a 70% lower hospital stay, so it's three days shorter. And you can see in the graphic there that uh, the patients there are staying four to five days as opposed to what we have seen before there where some people could stay for weeks. The ICU admission uh, for those patients there is 26%, so most patients ended up on the floor and being treated in the ER. Um, uh, and ventilators are 0%. That's fantastic news. So we are, we're having a huge problem a year ago with intubations and ventilators. It doesn't look like you need that. And the mortality rate still, unfortunately, is 9%. It is an improvement, but it's still a mortality rate. SGTF is the, is the word that a lot of um, scientific papers are referring to Omicron. So just get used to that. But you can really see in the graphic there in green is Omicron which basically has a very faster um, uh, discharge from the hospitals there, very low mechanical ventilation. We really want to see that. Uh, a lower mortality rate uh, than Delta had. And still some ICU admission there, really you can see there's a big drop there. So most people seem to be traded there without having to go to the ICU or be on mecha mechanical ventilation. That's fantastic news. So why is that? Because another paper came out showing that Omicron is less successful at infecting the lungs. And they've done some study there uh, in hamsters, and, and they've shown that the prior strain of, of SARS-CoV-2, uh, you know, were infecting the hamster very effectively. And that's why we had all these people there having lung diseases and, and needing ventilation. Now, this Omicron has mutated and doesn't bind to a protein called TMPRSS2. And that's important there because that is the protein that's on the, on the cells of the lungs. And that was one of the entry points that the prior uh, viruses were, were using that. So it's basically all this information is confirming that Omicron is exploding into your nose uh, you know, at a 70 times higher rate than the other ones, but is much lower. Uh, penetration into the lungs, and that's really important. Uh, another data just came out that the antibody uh, are, are unfortunately not seeing Omicron. And you can see that the, the alpha, the delta, and the gamma were very, very similar there, and so that the antibodies were able to still identify them. We're going to see a little bit later on another paper that showed that Omicron is able to evade 70% of the antibodies there. So Omicron is a new group of pathogen and there's gonna be more vaccine update on this. So Omicron is evading the immune system. And another study came out showing that the autoantibodies are elevated as long as six months after full recovery. And this, um, this may be linked uh, to some of the long COVID uh, results that we're seeing there. Uh, uh, another study showed uh, that's in publication right now showed that Omicron is only recognized by 30% of your total antibodies. This is really confirming why you need the booster. Because the booster, if you remember from my prior videos, increased by 85x the amount of antibodies. It's like a full-blown army that you're building. And that's why if Omicron is able to evade 70% of your antibodies, the other 30% when you have such a large army are still able to control the seriously, uh, the severity of the infection. You may get infected. I think it's pretty much sure that we're all going to be exposed and infected, but you won't get sever severely ill. So, uh, so the good news is that after infection or vaccination, the B cells are able to generate fresh antibody. And, and then it takes a couple of days for the B cells to compensate uh, the normal uh, neutralizing antibodies there. So that's why people get sick, you know, for a short period of time if they're fully vaccinated with a booster. So, so this is kind of a confirmation about why there's so many breakthrough cases, but no severe hospitalization. So uh, the mutation is also happening outside the spike, uh, which is typical of the, of, the, of the vaccine that we have developed. And, and so... Uh, what we are discovering is that Omicron is increasing the production of a protein called ORF9B. And this is a protein that enables him to evade the immune system. And, and that's because that's the signal, that, that's a protein that basically sends a signal called TOM70 that, to the cells to use the immune system and basically kick it in gear. So basically it's evading the antibodies and it's slowing down the response of the immune system. So it is a very, very smart, unfortunately, uh, mutation. What do we know about Omicron? Right now, unvaccinated seem have a very high risk 
uh, of developing uh, serious COVID symptoms there. Vaccinated, seems to develop what's called a sore throat, nasal and sinus congestions, headaches and body aches. Uh, you are most contagious when you feel sick, uh, but unvaccinated have two or three days of peak infectionness before they even feel the symptom. And that's going to be important because we're going to see in a few slides that the antigen testing absolutely miss that two or three day period just after you've been exposed and you start developing symptoms. So that's why we have this, that propagation across the country right now, because most people are walking out there infecting other people, but not being aware yet that they have been infected. The viral level will be at the highest on the third or the fourth day, which is when finally the antigen are picking up the infection there. So if you get an antigen testing, you test negative, you absolutely have to repeat it. If you have any serious concern, do a PCR, because the PCR will detect it during that time period. So uh, if you have anything that is a symptom of severe illness, difficulty breathing, intense chest pain, extreme weakness, you know, you have to go to the emergency room. In the power variant, we saw people dropping their oxygen saturation below 91%. That does not seem to be the same case here for Omicron. So really uh, be very aware of your symptoms. So long COVID risk is still unknown uh, uh, as far as Omicron, too much, you know, not enough time right now to basically see the long-term consequences. So if you're exposed to Omicron, there's an incubation period of three days. It's much shorter than the prior ones. Delta was 4.3 days and Alpha was five days. Testing, we're gonna go over this in a few minutes there. The lab-based PCR is looking for genetic material of the virus. It is the most accurate after infection. If you're able to access a lab-based PCR for your healthcare providers, do that. Uh, it can detect infection two to three days after you've been exposed. Another type of testing is the home molecular nucleic acid amplification called NAAT. It's looking at the genetic material of the virus. They're much more expensive, but they are more accurate, and it can detect an infection three to four days after exposures. And the last category is the at-home antigen test, and that one is taking up to 3.5 to 4.5 days after exposure before it starts to be uh, showing a positive test there. Uh, unfortunately, there's such a rush right now, it's very hard to find tests in the stores or even on Amazon. So uh, let's look at some of the Omicron um, uh, symptoms. You can see compared to Delta, sore throat is extremely typical now of Omicron, and the loss of smell and taste, which used to be typ typical of the original variants there, is pretty rare. It's like less than 12%. So if you're having anything like a sore throat and you start having some fever and coughing and, and muscle ache, uh, you know, you really need to be suspicious you may have been exposed. And this is based on a huge data set of 175,000 patients in the UK that had Omicron versus 88,000 Delta case. So let's kind of refresh ourselves on what's happening. The majority of the large aerosol deposit goes into the nasopharyngeal area there, which is your nasal passage, the pharynx and the larynx. And this is where Omicron is absolutely exploding compared to the other variant there. The good news, as we have talked earlier, is that it doesn't go as easily into the lungs. And that's really important there because that is where it goes into the body. Uh, what you can see is that it needs smaller particles to get into the lungs. The bigger particles just get stopped into the nose area there. And that's important there because this whole idea that we, um, we need to be six feet away and we can uh, have up to 15 minutes a time accumulation there before you get infected with the alpha variant is off the window now. Uh, one physician I was talking say, you know, told me that if it takes a thousand units to get sick with the alpha variant, now it takes less than 10 units of Omicron because it's, it's so explosive in the nasal cavity there. So you need to take a bit more distance there and be much more aware of your environment there, improve your mask to N95 and be very aware of respiration. We're going to review some of that. So airborne transmission, you can see drop very, very quickly there based on the size of the particles there. Uh, but it can stay in the air up to 12 hours. So really be aware of uh, the ventilation situation you're facing if you are with a crowd of people there. 
Ventilation is critical. Uh, get yourself some hair purifier there. You know, open the windows, get some, get, get some fresh air for your system there. Be very, very aware of where you are. And if you've got an elevator, there is no ventilation there. So somebody could be coughing before you come in there. So the Biden administration has just announced they're going to offer free home testing. Uh, you, uh, starting uh, on the 19th of January, you can go to covidtest.gov and order up to four tests per household. It will ship in 7 to 12 days and come to you. So you won't get anything until the end of January. The private insurance has been told starting on January the 15th, so yesterday, to reimburse you if you submit a claim up to $12 per test. Uh, and the insurers are in the process of setting up network of preferred stores and pharmacy to make it easier. And you can get up to eight tests per covered individuals per month. So if there's two people in your household, you can get 16 tests per month. Medicare, uh, right now it seems that Medicare, you have to go for your medical professional to a lab and it's free of charge. Uh, but Or you can go to the government website and, and order it. Medicaid and the Children Health Insurance Program uh, already cover home tests at no cost sharing. And the uninsured uh, have availability also for community health centers there. So uh, we expect probably a, a lot of demand on that covitest.gov. And as you know, there's a lot of shortage in the supply chain. So I think it's going to take several weeks before it comes into your doorsteps. But it is a step in the right direction. We desperately needed that. Let's do a quick review of the antigen testing. Bimax now from Abbott. Uh, is the one that's probably the most recognized. It has a sensitivity of 84% and a specificity of 98%. That means you could have false positive uh, up to 16% of the time. And so, uh, so if you test positive, you have COVID. If you test negative, you should repeat the test. It's unavailable right now in most of the stores in Amazon. Uh, but it costs between $25 to $30 for a box of two. There's eye health COVID-19. Uh, it has a slightly higher sensitivity. Uh, it's FDA approved. There has been mixed review on accuracy. It takes around 15 minutes, $20 for two tests. There's Lucera Check It, uh, which is a bit lower sensitivity there. It is a molecular test. Uh, it, it, it technically claims 98% specificity, uh, but it costs $75 to $89 per test, and it takes 30 minutes. There's Quidel Quick View, uh, which is uh, approved on the FDA for around $25. And there's Acon Flowfax, which I was recommended by several specialists. is probably the best of the bunch. I did order some uh, online to their website there. It has a very high specificity there. Uh, other type of test is from Beckton Dickinson, Veritor at Home. It uses a smartphone for you to get the results, and it's so you should make sure it works with your phone. And right now it works on the iPhone, Google, and some of the Samsung. It's around $29 to $35 for two tests. Another type is the Access BioCare Start at $70 per two tests. Illum uh, has been recalled because several of the lots have false positives, so I would stay away from that if you can. Uh, Detect is a molecular test that also needs an app on the iOS and the Android. Uh, that's so it's more expensive, seventy-five dollars per test, but it has much higher accuracy. OnGo Access Bio uh, is an antigen test. There, uh, it can be suitable for children as long as two years old. And Orasure IntelliSwap uh, is another antigen test uh, that takes up to thirty minutes. So lots of good testing there. Take a screenshot of this and 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 rely this because I think it's going to be difficult in the next two months. I think to get uh, enough tests for everybody. So this is important news. This just came out and is on a publication that the Omicron cases were infectious for two to three days before it is detected by the rapid antigen testing. And, and so they did a review of the Apple Binax versus the Quiddle Quick View rapid antigen testing. And it, this is in red. You can see all the false negative uh, for, for sure the first two days after the person has been infected and up to three days uh, compared to a PCR. Another paper just came out from South Africa showing that there is more virus in the saliva than in the nose and putting pressure on, on suggesting that we should also do a saliva test instead of just nasal swap. 
So you should use an N95 when, uh, when you think you could be exposed of Omicron. This is a, a text from Eric Topol from uh, Southern California, uh, which basically making a comment that the CDC recommendation to look at a mask with the best fit, it should just say use a N95 or K95 mask uh, because it's the only thing that protects you. We're going to go over that. Uh, last video, I'm going to quickly review this. Uh, we showed that the uh, mask uh, effectiveness to so the filtration there only really works with medical mask. It doesn't really work with some of the cotton tissue and other types. It's also the fitting is very important there. You want to make sure it's very nicely fit against your skin. If you look at the data there, I want to reshow this again, is the N95, uh, which is in, in blue here, has a 98% filtration rate. If you're losing a polypropylene mask with ear loop, it's 28%. The trillier cotton mask is 26%. And, and even surgical mask is, you know, is only 60% there. So uh, please go get an N95. I was able to fill up on Amazon uh, from 3M uh, and get a quality mask. So why is that? Because if you do get exposed, and I think it's pretty clear with Omicron, it's just a question of time, there's only limited drug treatment available. The oral antiviral pills, which have to be taken within five days of a positive test, are extremely in short supply. I think it's such in short supply that all the major centers I know here are only reserving them for very high risk and vaccinated patients there. Now, the Pfizer one, uh, when it becomes available, which will take several months, uh, to be in, in, in enough supply there, decreased hospitalized risk by 90% and will probably only be given to people at high risk. The monoclonal antibodies that we did use in the past are not working with Omicron. And so um, Regeneron you know, is not effective there. Um, the only one that seems to be working is the GlaxoSmithKline there, but it's very limited supply. There's only 50,000 doses per week. And uh, there's an AstraZeneca Evusheld, um, but it's only basically recommended for people who have been immunocompromised. Gilead Rendemzivir uh, is, uh, has to be given by intravenous injection, so it's not being really used on an outpatient settings there. It's kind of being reserved for people who are being hospitalized. And there's pretty much a treatment shortage right now. So key, get vaccinated and get boosted. Uh, if you want more information there, I'll post the... Um, the NIH or uh, treatment rec uh, guidelines there for uh, high-risk non-hospitalized patients. So this is very interesting data that just came out on, on the Lancet, uh, which is one of the top journal, and it's reviewing 900,000 people with Moderna versus 900,000 people with Pfizer. It's the first head-to-head -head, uh, between the two vaccines. And what it clearly shows, and this is on the Delta, so we don't have Omicron yet, is that Moderna, uh, which you can see in red there, is much more effective at protecting you against hospitalization. Uh, and so that's really important there be, between the mix and the matching. You see a lot of people who had the first two doses of Pfizer getting a Moderna uh, booster. Uh, so keep that in mind uh, if you're still selecting your booster there. So this is a really, really uh, important uh, report that just came out. Uh, and this is why, because if you look at Moderna uh, and, and the effectiveness when you have only two doses, and you can see how much of a drop Omicron is creating there in the protection uh, against infection there, you can see there's really pretty much no infection unless, unless you get the booster. If you do add the booster, your protection that was as low as 30% with the two doses there now is still at 64%. Uh, uh, if you get the three doses there. Uh, now, remember, it used to be 95% for Delta there. So you may get exposed, you may get infected, but you won't get hospitalized. And we're going to see a little bit later on more data, you know, validating this. Uh, uh, people we really worry is people over the age of 65. And again, it was another uh, analysis between Pfizer and Moderna, and also some of AstraZeneca, but I'll highlight in red the Pfizer's, and you can see that uh, the, the booster of Pfizer really makes a big difference in providing some effectiveness against hospitalization. I'm not talking infection, I'm talking hospitalization there. So the effectiveness 
um, uh, of, of Pfizer is a bit lower than Moderna, so again, confirming what we've seen in the other data set. Uh, but we still have an 89% protection against hospitalization for people of the age of 65. So yes, you will get infected, you may get some mild symptoms there, but if you're boosted, you will have very high protection against hospitalization. So boosted CDC update, we just have decreased uh, the time sure constraint between six months to five months uh, after the second dose. Immunocompromised, now I can get a fourth dose. Um, if you're immunocompromised, uh, there was a mandate, as you know, for forcing vaccination. The Supreme Court has approved the one for healthcare worker under the CMS Medicare oversight, but has rejected the one for large employers there. So we'll see what the employers decide to do at the individual level there. So Omicron may need its own vaccine. Both Pfizer and Moderna are working on a modified vaccine that will include all the prior variants plus Omicron. Uh, the earliest it would come is by March 2022. The CDC and the FDA are still thinking they may not need it, but my guess is that we will. Uh, vaccines are working. Uh, again, uh, re-emphasizing there, you may get infected there, but the vaccine is what you know is protecting you against a severe case. And this is the, the data that just came out uh, from uh, New York City and Seattle there, where you can see, yes, we have that huge surge of uh, uh, cases mostly in the unvaccinated. You can see the breakthrough cases uh, in the gray line there, but the hospitalization is mostly uh, the unvaccinated. And that three weeks, three weeks lag, you know, you expect uh, the faster death rise, which we're starting to see. Great news here for people who are boosted there. Uh, this is a very uh, di a big data set that just came out uh, with some of the early Omicron. And what it shows is that uh, only 1% of people were fully vaccinated and boosted uh, were part of a hospitalization. So they look at 10,000 patients that end up being hospitalized, uh, and then only 1% were fully vaccinated and boosted there. 64% were unvaccinated, and 27% were not boosted there. So uh, there's a lower in hospital mortality there is 7% for the fully vaccinated and boosted versus 12% for the people who are not fully vaccinated and a lower mechanical ventilation. So this is an idea of people who had breakthrough cases there and the, the amount of time that uh, they had a booster dose period there. And you can see that most of them are elderly uh, over the age of 60. Uh, in these two examples there, a couple of people went into the ICU uh, and, and we just see there's not too many mechani mechanical ventilation. So what's happening as far as the case rate? And I know I got a lot of people who made comment last time and I was trying to scare people, but what I predict unfortunately happened, which is if you look in the gray is the case rate and in the red is three weeks later, what's happening to the, uh, the death rate. Uh, and you can see these two curves are basically uh, superimposed uh, with, a, with a delta of three weeks. And it's basically the delay that I was unfortunately predicting is now going straight back up. And that's just because Omicron wave is so high that even if there's a lower hospitalization rate by 50%, we still see a huge surge of people being infected and high risk. So another way to look at this is, uh, this is an interesting data set that shows you can see the hospitalization goes up and then shortly afterwards the ICU and the ventilation follow. And you see this in New York, Washington and Chicago, the same type of curve. Uh, so yes, it is not as severe uh, as the Delta, but it's still at risk. Unvaccinated patients, you know, could end up unfortunately with a hospitalization. And the problem is that only 38% of Americans are boosted. That means 62% are at risk of getting infected and having some complications. The good news is 62%, around 62% of people over the age of 65 are boosted. And these are the ones who are at most at risk of a complication in the hospital. Uh, booster mix, you can see that uh, most people had Moderna, 92% had, had Moderna as a booster. If people had Pfizer, you know, the majority, you know, are also picking Pfizer. There are some mix and match. We can see people are doing that. A lot of people are J&J now, uh, are looking at Moderna uh, and Pfizer as a booster. Uh, and that's just because of the efficacy of, of those are higher than the original J&J. The occupancy, unfortunately, has gone up. It's the highest ever. 
Uh, we have over 140,000 seven day average occupancy in the US. 83% of the ICU beds are in use in the US. 33% are due to COVID. So remember, people can have heart attacks and strokes and other problems there where they need access to the ICU. One of the worry is that as the ICU surpassed 75%, historically, it increased the death rate uh, two weeks later because of the lower quality of care that's being provided. And for example, uh, it also has shown that if you have non-COVID cases in the ICU in an environment like this, you end up having a sicker cases and you have a longer length of stay by at least one day. And that's just because the nursing staff is so overwhelmed. Uh, so remember, it's not just about uh, the other people having COVID being in the hospital. So this could happen to all of us if we have another event. Uh, in addition to that, uh, what I just showed you was the occupancy. Now you look at the daily admission per 100,000, and you can see we are the one of the highest ever, where we are 21,000 daily cases being added into the admission of the hospitals there. And remember, people stay four to five days, and that's why you see so many beds being full. Uh, this graphic there is concerning in the sense that the lighter colors show you the infectivity level in pretty much the whole U.S. has very high uh, contagious levels. Uh, and so pretty much uh, you need to assume that wherever you go, in a store and all of that, that people could be infected and you need to take protection, you know, with washing your hand, uh, disinfecting them and wearing an N95 and be aware of the ventilation. So uh, since I talked to you, we went from 200,000 cases to 800,000 cases. So in 20 days, we pretty much triple the amount of cases and double hospitalization. Remember, I predict on one or two weeks delay, and that's exactly what's happening. So you see the number of cases now in the last two weeks have increased by 100% there. Hospitalization, 68%, and mortality, unfortunately, 60%. This is a comparison to what I shared uh, three weeks ago. You can see how the hospitalization went from 71,000 to 154,000, all driven by the COVID surge. And uh, in the upper left corner there, this is the, the graphic I showed three weeks ago in the hotspots, and you can see the whole country went dark red. Uh, as I said, it's pretty much everywhere. Uh, you can see the case rate. California, unfortunately, is number one in daily average of 119,000 cases there, with one of a very high rate of 303 per 100,000 there. But Texas is just behind, and Florida and New York, the, you know, all the states that we know are driving the surge. So, unfortunately, um, you know, uh, be safe. So, 98% of the cases now are Omicron. It's everywhere. Uh, this is by region. There's a tiny bit of Delta. It's still in the Midwest, but uh, probably by next week, everything is going to be Omicron. New York City is hoping it's peaking. You can see there's a drop there, but it still has a 27% positivity rate. What that means is that we may not be testing enough, so there could be a lot of people having cases that have not been officially confirmed by PCR test and reported. So um, I think, I think you know, we need to be careful with that data set. Uh, hospitalization, you know, remember there's that two weeks or three weeks delay. You can see it's going up as more than double. Mortality, unfortunately, is following up and the positivity rate has gone sky high, which means there's not enough testing. Typically, we're shooting for trying to get less than three to five percent positivity rate to, to know that we have enough testing being done. So uh, to be watched. So question is Omicron peaking. Uh, on the positive side, there is some data on wastewater analysis that project that uh, the pandemic may be slowing down. And this is in San Francisco, Sacramento, Massachusetts there. It's typically two to three weeks before the number of case rate goes up or down. So it's predictive. University of Washington has a group called the Health Metrics and Evaluation that a lot of people have been following their prediction. They are assuming that the true number of daily cases is totally unreported because so many people are doing tests at home and not necessarily doing a PCR that gets reported. And they estimate that the peak in January was as high as 6 million cases as opposed to a million cases, which is what was officially reported, so 6x. They are expecting the number of, of, of cases to peak in the hospital as 273,000. And I think I just show you that we're at 150,000 there, so that peak is going to continue to go up and then quickly drop down. Um, I'm not too sure it's going to drop that quickly on the hospitalization there, because remember, it takes five to six days for people to stay there. Uh, UK is peaking. 
uh, the, the 53% of the population that's boosted, uh, remember, we only have 38%, so they have a higher buffer to absorb the Omicron spreading for the population there. But the good news is that they're having a drop, so that's going in the right direction. But it's confusing because other countries are not moving the same. So uh, in Holland there, that had this massive lockdown over the holidays there, the case is still going up, uh, but hospitalization and ICU are going down. Uh, if we look at Germany, uh, it went down and went straight back up as soon as they re uh, released some of the restriction there. They have 46% of the population that's boosted. If I look at Israel, it's straight back up. And you saw some of the, the slide at the beginning there that France and Spain, all of that are also vertical. So, uh, and then not to make life boring, India is starting to have its own surge. Uh, and they also reported that in the last Delta wave, the mortality rate uh, was underreported by a factor of 6x. This is an important paper that's being published in Science. And that they estimated 3 million people died. So we may have the Omicron now taking over the Indian continent. Hospitalization, as we discussed, has unfortunately gone up. Uh, mostly driven by the f unvaccinated. And you can see in the age group there, it's mostly the elderly that are really driving just due to probably pre-existing conditions uh, and aging and weaker immune system there, the big drive uh, in the hospital setting. But it's all ages, including in the yellow here, the under 18. Uh, Omicron is 25% less fatal, um, and, but still the unvaccinated are, are at high risk. And remember, there's a direct correlation between people who have um, a, a death rate versus vaccination rate. So please, and you know, and part of the thing is that when you have a very high vaccination environment where you live, the Omicron has a harder time to, to basically spread around the population as opposed to people with a lower vaccination rate and then the Omicron can really proliferate. Uh, an interesting uh, study just came out using uh, the CDC and CMS Medicare data there that basically uh, estimated that over 690,000 hospitalization could have been prevented by vaccination between June to November 2021 at a cost of $13.8 billion uh, to the hospital systems. Uh, so, so remember, you know, if, you know, it does cost to the system a lot of money uh, if people continue to be unvaccinated there. So uh, on a totally different news, uh, we talked about long COVID in the past. And one of the way to look at the fact is that European elite soccer players had a much higher uh, infection rate, if you can see in red there, the infection rate of the players in Germany and Italy, which are some of the big leagues in Europe there. So they, a lot of them end up with a high rate of infection rate. But when they came back, they had a really uh, big problem up to 225 days to really get back in shape the way they are. And most of them have not returned uh, five to six months uh, at the level of what's called a professional athletes uh, in those fields there. And that could be another representation that, you know, COVID is not just a three to five days flu here. It's something that, you know, unfortunately can take months to fully recover. And in certain cases, like long COVID, you may not fully recover. Another one that was an interesting data for a lot of, uh, of you who have children that are doing a distance learning right now is that a math test just showed the results across different states is that the standardized math test really dropped uh, uh, in the last year compared to normal standards. You can see in red, it was the pandemic years. You can see Virginia was hit the hardest one, but pretty much across all states there, you can see the underperformance. So uh, as we know, you know, distance learning is not as good as private, uh, as, 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 it's not as good as uh, school uh, teaching. So uh, if you want to know more, I did a deep dive on the science also on December 28th. Uh, the video is on YouTube. I really appreciate your support. If you like uh, this content, it's a lot of love and hard work on my side. Uh, please give me a thumbs up and post it to your network. Uh, hopefully I'll see you in a month, unless like what happened now, there's so much data came out, I'll give you a, a faster uh, video update. Stay safe and uh, uh, see you in a few weeks.